Hello everyone and welcome back. I hope that everyone had a great reading week and that you were able to take some time for yourselves. This week our tutorial is going to focus on intervals, both likelihood intervals and confidence intervals, though for those of you who have done the reading, you may remember that these two concepts can actually be one and the same. I will start this week with a recap of what has been covered since last time, talking through what you should have learned in the Mobius lectures and from reading the course notes. Then, I want to revisit thinking statistically and dive into a deeper explanation interpreting confidence intervals. In order to do this, I'm going to be discussing a paper which concludes, and I quote, our findings suggest that many researchers do not know the correct interpretation of a confidence interval. It's my goal to ensure that none of you fall into this category. Following that, I will demonstrate the use of a web application that you can use to get a better feel for both likelihood and confidence intervals to solidify your understanding. Then we will explore a sample problem that deals with these concepts and I'll show you how they can connect to what we've previously learned in this course. Finally, I will come back here to talk about what you have to look forward to for the next week in STAT 231. There have been quite a few topics covered over the past few weeks. I'll try to recap them quickly here. We started by introducing statistical models and estimation, and then more specifically estimators and their sampling distributions. You should be able to differentiate between estimators, which are random variables, and estimates, which are specific values. Moreover, you should feel comfortable with the concept of a sampling distribution. We then introduced likelihood intervals. You should feel comfortable computing likelihood intervals and using them to interpret the plausibility of values for a parameter of interest. Moreover, though this is jumping slightly ahead, you should be able to use likelihood intervals as confidence intervals and understand the asymptotic pivotal quantity that they produce. Confidence intervals were discussed focusing on the use of pivotal quantities and asymptotic pivotal quantities. You should understand how these intervals are constructed, understand what a pivotal quantity is with the ability to identify whether a given quantity is in fact a pivotal quantity, and use asymptotic pivotal quantities, especially those derived from the likelihood ratio or the CLT to form interval estimates. We introduced both the chi-squared and the t-distributions. You should feel comfortable working with either of these distributions, and they should be added to your list of common distributions for this course, alongside those that we have previously seen. The focus of this section is on the quantification of uncertainty through the use of interval estimators. This is an incredibly widespread and important technique in statistics and in research more broadly. In the next parts of this tutorial, we will try to explore more deeply what confidence intervals mean, and perhaps more importantly, what they do not mean. While it will often, though not always, be the case that computing a confidence interval for a particular parameter only requires the application of routine calculations, the simplicity obscures what I perceive to be the real challenge, interpretation. Confidence intervals seem to be very straightforward. They consist of a lower bound and an upper bound, which are selected in such a way so as to give you a set level of confidence that, if you were to apply this procedure, your interval will contain the truth very often. This apparent simplicity hides a lot of nuance that's easy to miss if you're not careful, and it's my goal here to make sure that it is not missed. Let's begin by defining what a confidence interval is. To do this, recall that we say that an estimator is a function of random variables, typically sample y1 through yn, Remember that any function of random variables is itself a random variable, and so estimators are random variables. Because estimators are random variables, they have a distribution. So you can see the previous tutorial which covered sampling distributions if this does not feel familiar. Now, because an estimator is a random variable and it has its own distribution, we can make probability statements regarding any estimator. A confidence interval consists of two estimators, L of y, which is the lower bound, and u of y, which is the upper bound, such that the probability that L of y is less than the true parameter value, which is less than the upper bound, is given by p. In this case, we say that this is a p percent confidence interval. If p is, say, 0.95, then this is a 95 percent confidence interval. Now, what's important to note here is that we are dealing with two estimators, two functions of the data. Both L and U are estimators themselves, and as a result, they have distributions, sampling distributions, and we can make probability statements about these estimators. When we look at the probability statement, 
probability that L of Y is less than theta, which is less than U of Y, it's important to ask ourselves, what is random here? The answer is that both L of Y and U of Y and not theta. To emphasize this point, you could rewrite this probability as the joint probability that L of Y is less than theta and that U of Y is greater than theta. Theta is some fixed value. We don't know what its value is, but we do know that it's just some number. As a result, theta does not have a distribution, and we do not talk about probabilities with respect to theta. The important point being made here is that numbers, even numbers that we do not know the value of, do not have meaningful statistical distributions. Where this gets particularly challenging with confidence intervals is in the interpretation of an interval that has been computed. Recall that our definition of a confidence interval was with respect to two estimators, two different random variables that taken together fit a particular probability statement. We can use these estimators to form estimates of a confidence interval given a particular sample. The computed estimates are not random variables. They are just numbers. As a result, let's say that we've computed a 95% confidence interval with L of Y equal to 0.1 and U of Y equal to 0.4. It is no longer correct to say that the probability that theta is in the interval is 95%. The probability is either one, if the true value of theta is between these values, or it is zero, if the true value of theta is outside of this interval. Without knowing the true value of theta, we cannot say. So the question remains, how do we interpret confidence intervals then? My preference is to frame it in terms of repeated sampling, just as we did with the sampling distribution. The idea is that a confidence interval is a procedure for estimating a range that, if we were to repeat many times, would contain the true value in a set proportion of the intervals. For instance, a 95% confidence interval is such that if we were to draw 100 different samples from our data, and form 100 different intervals. In approximately 95 of them, we would expect the true value of theta to be contained. Note, this interpretation says absolutely nothing about any particular confidence interval. It talks about the procedure, not the intervals themselves. Oftentimes, we will use the phrasing, we are 95% confidence that the given interval contains the true value of theta to be a shorthand way of describing this above procedure. The discussion of and interpretation of confidence intervals is a subject that researchers get particularly worked up about. To illustrate the point, I'd like to perform a fun little task now. In January 2014, an article titled Robust Misinterpretation of Confidence Intervals was published, which tested the ability of researchers and students to correctly assess the truth of statements relating to confidence intervals. As the conclusion of the paper states, our data, however, suggests that both researchers and students have no reliable knowledge about the correct interpretation of confidence intervals. Surprisingly, researchers' self-reported experience in statistics did not predict the number of incorrectly endorsed interpretations. Even worse, researchers scored about as well as first-year students without any training in statistics. Now, I have some issues with this paper, but it certainly caused a stir. As a fun exercise, which is also good training for you all, I'd like to give you the test that they gave to students and researchers, and I'd like to see how you fare. Try this out. I will give you a scenario and then ask five true or false questions. Try to determine whether the statement is true or false and see how well you do. I'll wait until the end for a discussion of the answers. Remember, even trained researchers did very poorly on this exercise, so it's certainly non-trivial. The scenario goes, Professor Bumbledorf conducts an experiment, analyzes the data, and reports, quote, the 95% confidence interval for the mean ranges from 0.1 to 0.4. Decide whether each of the following statements are true or false based only on the information provided. I'll pause briefly after each to give you a chance to answer. Statement one. The probability that the true mean is greater than zero is at least 95%. Statement two. The probability that the true mean equals zero is smaller than 5%. Statement three. The statement that the true mean equals zero is likely to be incorrect. Statement four. 
there is a 95% probability that the true mean lies between 0.1 and 0.4. Statement 5. If we were to repeat the experiment over and over, the 95% of the times the true mean falls between 0.1 and 0.4. Did you get the answers to everything? Feel free to go back and try to answer these, and in just a moment here, I will give you the correct answers. In this case, all five statements are false. None of these are correct interpretations of the confidence interval, but let's explore why quickly. Statements 1, 2, 3, and 4 all deal with probability statements regarding the true mean. Remember, the true mean is just a number, and so the probability statements we make are not with respect to it. In fact, in each of these cases, the statement compares one number, the mean, to other numbers, either 0 in the case of statements 1, 2, and 3, or the interval for statement 4. These statements are never the correct formation for the confidence intervals. Statement 5 was incorrect, but for a different reason. Statement 5 had the benefit of discussing repeating the experiment over and over, but it made the mistake of including the specific interval. That is, if we repeat the experiment over and over, we expect to get different intervals each time. It will not always be 0.1 to 0.4. It's in 95% of these different intervals that we expect the true mean to fall, not in the one that we happen to have computed. I think that this paper does a good job indicating that we need to be careful when we are dealing with confidence intervals. It's easy to misinterpret them even when you're someone who works with them frequently. Now, I will admit this paper originally included six statements and claims that all six are false. I disagree with them and it seems that I am not alone. There have been response papers and responses to those responses, all published since, and it has turned into something of an academic feud. I guess that this means that even the people who purport to be studying whether or not researchers understand confidence intervals may themselves make mistakes when interpreting confidence intervals. If you're interested, I will include some of the papers on the course website. Some of the comments in them are beyond the material that we cover in STAT 231, but it may be interesting to see these misconceptions in the real world. Next, we will consider a web application that helps to solidify this understanding. Here we have another web application, similar to the one dealing with QQ plots, which looks at interval estimation and the relevant coverage probabilities. In the left-hand panel, you select the interval type, distribution of interest, as well as the sample size, true value, number of repeated samples, and the interval percentage, which is either the confidence level or the likelihood level. When you click Resample, a plot is generated that visually displays each of the intervals as compared to the true value, and marks in red the intervals which do not contain the true value. I'd encourage you to start playing around with this as the application gives you the exact way to interpret intervals. Recall that a confidence interval is interpreted based on repeating the process many times. That is exactly what we are doing here. Each of the lines represents one repeated version of the process, and we can see that as we do it many times, the proportion that cover the interval goes towards our confidence level. We also see that every interval is either black, meaning the truth is contained, or red, meaning it is not. We would not say that any one interval has a 95% chance of containing the parameter. Each either does or does not. This tool is also useful to explore the relationship of sample size to intervals that are estimated. It may not be clear, but when you increase the sample size, take a look at the axis on this plot. Small samples lead to more uncertainty than large samples, which makes sense. We saw this with sampling distributions directly, and the same idea is present here. When we say that we have samples of size 1000, we can afford to make the interval smaller and still capture the truth 95% of the time. The reverse is true if we drop the sample size down to 10. Theorems 34 and 35 give us the capacity to relate likelihood intervals, which, to recap, are intervals that are formed by taking all values of a parameter which make the relative likelihood exceed some specified value, to confidence intervals. We saw that a p% likelihood interval can be expressed as a q% confidence interval, 
where q is given by 2 times the probability that a standard normal is less than the square root of negative 2 times log of p minus 1. This relationship can be inverted as well. The notes show that we can treat 15% likelihood intervals as 95% confidence intervals approximately. Switching the interval type to likelihood and resampling many times should convince you of this fact. In fact, I'd encourage you to play around with these two theorems and the application simultaneously, setting a likelihood or confidence level, computing the equivalent, and seeing how the results compare. Likelihood interval percentages are fairly easy to interpret. A 10% likelihood interval includes all values for which the relative likelihood was greater than 10%. While easy to interpret, this interpretation does not necessarily give a good sense for what they are, and generally the conversion into a confidence interval will help, even though confidence intervals are hard to interpret. This conversion shows clearly why a 15% likelihood interval represents values which are plausible as they represent roughly 95% confidence. Hopefully this application can give you a better sense of how these concepts are tied together, and I would highly recommend spending some time with it. In the next section, we'll take a brief look at some example problems related to these concepts and try to reinforce how the different intervals are actually computed. Hello, this is Dylan from the future, and I have some unfortunate news. While editing together this tutorial video, I've realized that the audio from my example problem solving is completely unusable. I'm not really sure what happened, but unfortunately that means that I have to discard that section of the video. What I'm going to do instead is post the questions that I had answered in this example problem and some solutions that are typed up and explained to the course website. If there is anything that is unclear, I am more than happy to turn this into another video that I can post at some time over the next week or so, but I wanted to make sure that I got this tutorial out on time despite these technical challenges. So I apologize greatly for that, but hopefully you all get the chance to take a look at what it is that I was going to work through and definitely let me know if you have any questions. I hope that this tutorial was informative and helped clarify how we work with confidence intervals. Over the next week, you will continue to dig into confidence intervals, specifically focusing on the Gaussian model, which is a very important specific application. Then we will begin to discuss hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is fundamental to the work we do as statisticians, and in fact, hypothesis testing is fundamentally the tool that allows us to answer research questions. A central topic to hypothesis testing is the p-value, and just as confidence intervals can be difficult to interpret, so too can p-values. This week then, I'd stress that you should pay attention to how p-values are defined and what they represent. They are not easy and may require a few times over to let it really sink in. I'd also say that there is a very strong connection between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. This is a connection that is helpful to notice and to use to your advantage while trying to learn about these topics. In any event, we will discuss all of this in next week's tutorial. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful week, and thank you for watching.